talk about another problem called the loop-de-loop. -loop. We had a car, I have a little um, car here where I can wind up a spring. And then I'm going to put it in this loop to loop and hopefully it'll go around. Let me give it a little push. And notice it detached. On one of the uh, loops, it started to break free of the surface and then it caught itself and continued on and, and almost made it up again. And what's going on here is what I'm interested in. What's going on at the top? Let's look at the top of this motion. So I'm going to place this here. Let's draw a circle. At the very top, I'm going to draw the car as a dot. It's a center of mass. It's a free body diagram. Here's the center of the circle. This would be the radius of the circle. And I'm going to draw forces on the car. One of the forces on the car is its weight, pointing straight down towards the center of the earth. That's mg. There's another force on the car. It's the force that the surface here, the road bed, exerts on the car. And it's perpendicular to the surface and it pushes on the car downward. It prevents the car from going off in a straight line because the car is moving at a tangential velocity, like so. And these are perpendicular to each other. So the normal force of the surface pushing on the car is in the same direction as the weight. And these two forces are a net unbalanced force. We call it the centripetal force, a center-seeking force. And it produces a centripetal acceleration, a center-seeking acceleration. Now, the centripetal force is produced, can be produced by many different forces, but it's an unbalanced net force that creates this center-seeking acceleration called the centripetal acceleration. And recall, the centripetal acceleration, if you want its magnitude, is equal to the tangential speed squared divided by the radius of curvature. This is a useful formula, but this is not an example of motion under constant acceleration. This would be an example of uniform circular motion where the object is going around the circle at a constant speed. But since its velocity vector is constantly changing direction, it is, it is accelerating. That's non-negotiable. Its magnitude is this, but this is still not a constant acceleration because the acceleration vector is constantly changing directions. Even though it's pointing towards the center of the circle, it's constantly changing directions as the car goes around. Now this is an, um, a perfect example of uniform circular motion because the car is slowing down, but you could imagine it continuing on at the same speed and then you could easily calculate what its centripetal acceleration is. Let's solve this for what we would call the minimum speed so it can just make it, just make it around. The wheels will start detaching. That would be the case when the normal force goes to zero. So let's solve this using F equals MA, or Newton's second law of motion. If we apply F equals MA, the net force would be these two, force, these two forces summed up I'm going to call towards the center of the circle the positive direction. So it'll be the normal force, magnitude of the normal force, plus the weight. And that's going to equal MACP. This is the net unbalanced force that will produce the centripetal acceleration. Let's set, let's set N equal to zero. This is the limiting case. This is when the car would be momentarily weightless. And if it wasn't moving this way, it would just fall straight down. But it does have some tangential velocity, so it keeps going. So let's look at this. If I make N zero, this becomes plus mg equals mac. And notice what happens here. The m's cancel out, and I have g equals ac in this limiting case. Well, that's nice. I'll move this over a little bit. Well, what does ac equal? We'll look over here. AC equals V squared over R. So this implies that G equals V squared over R. And then if I solve for V, multiply both sides by R, I'll get V squared equals GR. And I'll take the square root. And this is a nice result here, nice simple result for the minimum speed that the car has to go at to just make it, really. It's, it's weightless. It's really going to go uh, airborne. Just The wheels are just detached from the track when that normal force goes to zero. This would be the minimum speed. Now, you want the normal force to be greater than zero. You want some insurance. You want to make it around. So whatever this velocity comes out to be at that particular point, this speed velocity would be its tangential.
plus this direction magnitude. You want to make your speed at this point greater than this. Let's say it was, I don't know, 17 meters per second. Make it 19 meters per second or something a little higher so that you do make it around. You give yourself some insurance to make it around. But there you go, the loop to loop. Thank you. Welcome back. I want to briefly talk about friction. I want to talk about the case where we have a, a wooden block or some other block sliding down an inclined plane. And let's imagine we have an incline at a certain angle, and we can vary the angle. And the, there's a block of wood on this particular incline. It could be wood on wood or metal on wood, metal on glass, as long as it's allowed to slide. One surface is allowed to slide relative to the other. And I want to draw in all the force vectors on this particular block. Now recall, weight will point straight down, mg. The normal force will be perpendicular to the surface. I'm going to make that my y-axis. I want to make the incline, down the incline, my positive x-axis. So it's a tilted coordinate system. And this allows me to break up my weight into its x component, wx, and its y component, wy. And as we've talked about in the past, this angle here corresponds to the angle with the y-axis and the weight vector. So I'm going to just draw those angles in there. And let's assume there's friction holding this block in place. And it's not moving. It's at rest. That friction would be known as static friction, F sub s. It's holding it in place. And let's say we increase this angle just when this begins to move. We just see it move. That's the case I'm interested in. I want to figure out what that angle is. We're going to call that angle the angle of friction or striction. So let's find what that is. First of all, you should know that the friction force equals mu s n when it's at a max. That's the force you have to break through to get it to slide. And the normal force in this case will not just equal its weight, it'll equal the y component of the weight. So if I put the y component of the weight in here, remember any vector, the weight vector can be broken up into an x, x and y component. The y component will be a fraction of the total weight. The mg times the cosine of theta in this case because the angle is adjacent to that side. And I also got to put in my mu s. Let me squeeze that in here. mg cosine theta. So this is my normal force, mg cosine theta times mu s. Now that's the friction force. The x component of the weight is the component of the weight that's causing it to move down the incline. I'm going to uh, find the net force between these two and apply F equals MA. So if I do that, apply F equals MA, I have the friction force up the incline, that would be negative, and I have the, weight, the x component of the weight down the incline, that would be positive. So it's going to be WX minus F sub S, and that will equal M and the acceleration in the x direction, excuse me, I'm going to purposely set the acceleration in the x direction equal to zero. Because I just want to get that limiting case when it's just about to move. And that allows me to do that. So if I set this equal to zero, that means the x component of the weight will equal the friction force here. So what is the x component of the weight? Well, it's going to be a component of mg. It's going to be mg times the sine of theta. So I'll write that in. mg times the sine of theta. And fs, we figured that out, out already. It's mu s mg cosine theta. Now what I'm interested in is figuring out with what the coefficient of static friction is. That's something I want to measure. And let's solve this for that. Notice that the weights cancel out. mg on this side, mg on that side cancel out. And I have mu s on this side. I'm going to bring it over on this side. I have sine on the other side. I'm bringing it over here. And cosine is in front of the, in front of the mu uh, sub s here. I'm going to divide both sides by cosine theta. And notice what I have here. Sine of theta over cosine theta. Well, that's the tangent of theta. And that is a nice result. Mu sub s, the coefficient of static friction, equals the tangent of the angle of inclination there, which could be called the angle of 
of friction, or it could be called striction. This angle right here, angle of friction. That allows us to fi figure out what the maximum striction is. Static friction, striction. And isn't that interesting? And we did do a lab involving these concepts where we place different objects on different surfaces and we change the angle and we watch for when we witness that the object just began to move. And then we measured this angle, we took the tangent of it, and it allowed us to calculate in a nice, simple way the coefficient of static friction. to talk about a physics problem we did much earlier about throwing um, two objects off of a building and the landing speeds being the same. Recall that the particular problem we studied had to do with two snowballs. One snowball was launched straight down at 13 meters per second and would hit the ground at some later time. And we want to figure out what the landing speed is, or the speed right before it hits. Another snowball was thrown from the horizontal 25 degrees, like so, so 25 degrees from the horizontal, and it was thrown at the same speed, initial speed of 13 meters per second. What we wanted to do is compare these speeds, the landing speed. Are these landing speeds actually the same? Does that pan out in the math? Well, let's look at that. This particular snowball that would be launched from this location would follow a nice trajectory a parabolic trajectory. Remember, this parabolic motion is really an approximation. It's actually part of an ellipse. When we get into satellite motion, we'll talk more about that. But for right now, we're treating this trajectory as a parabola, parabolic motion. Okay, if we look at this, I want to analyze what is the final speed in the y direction for the first snowball, the one that's thrown straight down. And then I want to look at what is the final speed, and I have to look at the vertical speed and the horizontal speed of this particular snowball that follows the parabolic trajectory, and I have to combine them. They add such that the net effect is this velocity vector here, which would be V total. Remember, velocity is the vector sum the net velocity is a vector sum of the horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity. And there will also be an angle here. I'm not drawing this to scale or, um, correctly, but uh, mathematically we have to add up those two vectors. And the magnitude of that vector will be the speed. So we're really looking for what is the magnitude of this net total velocity, um, which would be the speed. And we're going to compare it to the speed here, which only has a y component. The x component is zero. So the initial x for this particular vector is zero. It's zero up here, and it's going to be zero down here. Now the initial y for this vector is negative 13. This particular vector also has an initial velocity, and I'm going to draw it there. Its v initial x is not zero. And what's interesting about projectile motion, if you can neglect air friction, is that this particular velocity, v naught x, will stay constant through the entire motion. For example, when you get to the peak, it'll still be v naught x. When you get to uh, some point over here past the horizontal, it'll still be v naught x. And so v final at the end, right before it hits, it'll also be v naught x. It turns out in projectile motion, the final velocity in the x direction will equal the initial velocity in the x direction, we equal the average velocity in the x-direction. It doesn't change, it's constant. So how do we find that? Well, what we do is we look at the geometry of this right triangle, and I'll take the hypotenuse, which is 13, and I'll multiply by the cosine of 25 degrees there. And when I work that out, I believe that comes out to about 12, if you round it. So that would be 12 meters per second roughly. And there also is a y component which is equal to, this is v initial y, 
for this particular snowball, the one thrown at the 25 degree angle, it's equal to the 13 times the sine of 25 degrees. And I'm going to use that in an equation in, in a moment. So there we go, there's our situation. We want to figure out the final speed of this snowball and the final speed of this snowball. And it turns out that they actually are equal. That landing speed does not depend on the launch angle. The only thing it depends on is the initial speed. The initial speeds here have to be the same. And of course we have to be throwing it from the same height. And let's make this height 7 meters. So they're being, both being a launch from 7 meters above the ground. This is the ground. They're both being launched at the same launch speed. They should have the same landing angle. One of the things that's different is this one's going to reach the bottom much quicker than the one that has the, the much longer trajectory. The time of travel is different in, in this case, but the landing speeds are the same. So how do we figure out the landing speed? Well, the one thing we do is we're going to apply this equation, v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a change in x. And this is for um, the x direction and the y direction. I want to look at this formula in terms of the y direction only. Remember, this is velocity as a function of displacement. It's time independent, which is nice. So let's write this in. Vy final squared equals v initial in the y direction squared. And I'm going to put minus g in here for the acceleration. So minus 2g, and I'll make this into change in y because I'm talking about the vertical direction. I'm going to call this the y-axis. So here's my y-axis. I'm going to call this the x-axis. And I'm going to use this formula to solve for the final uh, velocity in both cases, for this case and this case. I'm just going to change the, the launch angle. One is 90 degrees, or negative 90 degrees actually, because it's below the horizontal. That would be negative 90 degrees. And this one is plus 25 degrees. But same initial speed and everything else being, being equal. And the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.81 meters per second squared. It's downward. That's our, our negative g. So what is this going to be? We're going to have to take the square root of v initial y squared minus 2g change in y. Now I know the displacement change in y is minus 7. If I call this my 0, 0 point, this would be minus 7 for the displacement or change in y. And that's the same for both cases, and that's what we need. We need that to be the same. Minus 7 meters. Okay, let's substitute in what we have here. And v initial y, remember, we have to write it in component form. It's going to be 13 sine 25. If I write it in symbolic form, it would be v naught, the initial velocity here, right there, 13 meters per second, times the sine of theta, which is 25 degrees. And we have to square that. So I could rewrite the equation like this. I also could simplify it. A lot of times this is written as, let me just show you here, it's written as Vy equals the square root, and they're bringing the square inside the parentheses here. It means the same thing, but I guess I'll just write it that way for you so you can see it. And this is the formula I want to use for both cases. Let's apply it to this case first. If I apply it to this case first, what does that come out to be? Well, I'm going to put in the numbers. It's going to be 13 squared, sine, and the angle is negative 90. And that's going to be minus 2g, which is 9.81 meters per second squared, and then times a negative displacement. That'll make this positive, because a negative times a negative is a positive. And when I work this out, it rounds to about 18 meters per second. And that's it. There is no v naught uh, x. So when I sum these up, I could use the Pythagorean theorem to get the net velocity, but the net velocity is just going to be vx squared, which is 0, plus vy squared, which is 18, so that 0 times the square root, from putting the square root of 18 squared, it's just going to be 18. So it doesn't change anything. However, on this side, we're going to have to um, combine those two. But let's get Vy first. What's Vy going to be? 
Well, it's set up the same way as this one. I mean, the only thing different is the angle. So when you put it in here, um, we're going to do 13 squared again. Sine squared of 25 degrees. That's minus 2 once again, 9.81 meters per second squared times a displacement of negative 7 meters. That's under the square root. And it is positive and negative out here on the square root. And you use that to determine what direction your velocity is. If I'm making my velocities up positive, then the ones going down are negative. So this is really a negative. And when I square a negative in the square root here, it, it's a, a positive. So you don't really have to worry about it too much if you have the picture. Okay, so what does that come out to be? If we look at that, we're going to get uh, 13 for that. That should come out to be about 13. And we'll make it negative 13. And that's meters per second. So what do we have here? We have this equal to negative 18 meters per second. We have this equal to negative 13 meters per second. At this point, they don't look like they match. And they shouldn't. But we have to combine this negative 13 meters per second, this velocity vector down, with the horizontal velocity. We need to figure out that. And we figured that out earlier up here. We figured it out to be 12 meters per second. So that's 12 meters per second. We need to combine these using the Pythagorean theorem. So let's do that. And I'm going to put that right over here. V total for this snowball right here will be vx squared plus vy squared. We take the square root. So we're going to have for vx, we have 12 squared plus negative 13 squared, just 13 squared. We get the square root of 144 plus 169, which equals the square root of 313, which, if we take that, it should come out to be approximately 18. If we round it up, we should get 18 meters per second. And that is the speed for the second snowball, which is, um, or the first one I, I drew up there, 18 meters per second. The only thing difference, it, it hits at an angle. We could figure out that angle. It's roughly, it's about 47, 48 degrees if you figure it out. It gets very steep as this continues on. It's very steep. So 18 meters per second there. And over here we have 18 meters per second. So if we just review for a second, if you launch a projectile, in this case it's two snowballs, and you throw them at the same initial speeds, what happens is that when you throw them, the landing speeds will be the same regardless of what launch angle you do. The landing speeds are independent of launch angle, and that's very interesting. You do need the height to be the same, and you do need the um, initial speeds to be the same. But other than that, the results are the same. The one difference, though, is the time of travel for this particular projectile right here, the one shot at the 25 degree angle above the horizontal, takes a longer time than the one thrown straight down. And that is um, an obvious result. Thank you.